I want to especially thank Diane and all of the volunteers here. It is no small feat to put this event on, and I know that it takes a lot of time out of our lives um, to be dedicated to something like this. As long as it has been ongoing, 20 years, over 190 speakers, I can't fathom the number of hours that each and every one of you have dedicated to this organization, and I am very grateful for that. Um, I myself support IANS because I believe that it is a beautiful meeting place for people of thousands, if not more, of um, spiritual philosophies, and for those who are seeking more, and I think that it is an amazingly safe, <coughs> grounded space to listen to other people's experiences and determine whether or not it resonates with you. And if it does, then that's probably why you were here today. And if it doesn't, then maybe one day it will. Or, more importantly, next Thursday, you might run into somebody in the grocery store that needs to hear about your experience. Um, I think that IANS is an incredible organization, very much rooted in the scientific study and research of these types of experiences, and I will be speaking this year at their annual conference, and I hope to continue to do so for many years to come. I know many of the people that are involved with the organization at the national level, and they are all class acts. And so I thank you all for any donations that you make. Not only does Diane use some of the funds, <clears throat> as I'm sure you all know, to support nonprofit endeavors, but it helps to pay um, expenses for people like myself to come here and to share our stories. So thank you very much. They say that you should never start out a speech with an apology, and you should never read your speech. Well, in the beginning, I used to read my speech, and I would always apologize. And I spoke to room, rooms full of hundreds of doctors, and I would say, <clears throat> you know, I was on opioids for four years, so my memory is somewhat affected. And I don't want to forget the really incredible nuggets of information. But I watched myself on video reading my speech, and I don't do that anymore. <laughs> and I understand why some people, if you read your speech, they don't want you to come to their meeting. So um, what I'm hoping is that the little parts and pieces that I miss, if it's important for you to know in the question and answer later, someone will ask a question that will remind me that I forgot to say the most incredible part. So um, please stick around for the question and answer. It's my favorite part. And sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit beating you over the stick with stories you've already heard hundreds of times to share mine. Um, but my story is a little bit different in that it's not in the experience itself, and it's not in that I came back fully healed because I did not. I came back on a mission to heal and to find out how to heal and then share that information. Now that doesn't mean that it's only my way or the highway or there's only one way. Um, hundreds if not thousands of ways that everyone can heal and certainly at different moments and different milestones in our lives, uh, different healing modalities are appropriate. I know I wanted to say a few beautiful, funny things before I got started, and I can't remember them right now. <laughs> Maybe later. Um, what I thought I would do is start out today with a more recent experience I had during a healing session. And over the course of my healing, I have um, experienced many different healing modalities. <laughs> Me, um, and healing uh, healers, and I've had many healing opportunities that uh, are pretty fantastic. Some of these types of healing opportunities are working with the shadow self, working with the ego, working with the wounded inner child. And for me, that came last on my journey, and by no means am I saying I am done or complete. But this last piece in the past year and a half has been very profound for me. And in doing that, 
I was able to tap into some memories that I had previously forgotten. And one of the memories was I was two years old, and it was the first time that my mother ever struck me across my face with an open hand. And of course I started crying and I was horrified. But beyond that, as I was intending to release that, the memory and the trauma of that from my body, I began to sob and wail uncontrollably. And I wasn't sure why, but I had a vision of a very small infant. And in that session, I realized that when I was three months old, and I had whooping cough, and I was packed in a tent in ice, and my mother had told me once when I was young, you know, you almost died when you were three months old. You had turned blue, and the doctors and nurses thought that you weren't going to make it. In that moment, I remembered that I, I had forgotten that for maybe 40 years. And I saw myself as that three-month-old, incredibly angry, face to face with the Creator, screaming that He wanted to send me back to my life. And I proclaimed, absolutely not. This is not the, this is the first time, by the way, I've shared this publicly, so I do apologize if I cry. Um, this is not the life that I expected to have. This woman is mentally ill. She's going to have numerous husbands. I'm going to be sexually assaulted. I'm going to be um, a frightened, victimized little girl who's going to grow up to not be a very good mother <laughs> because of it. And this is not the life I expected. And I knew that because in that moment, I saw the vision of the life that I was supposed to have when I incarnated. My mother was a teenager, a pregnant teenager, and when her father found out that she was pregnant, he threw her down the stairs and kicked her out of the house. Finally, the family resolved because my grandmother, her mother at the time, was also pregnant with a child, that they would send her to relatives where she would have the baby and give the baby up for adoption. But when she got to the relatives who lived in a junkyard, in a trailer house, with very little money, somehow they convinced her that was a, a good idea for an 18-year-old that hadn't finished high school to have a baby with no husband and no money and no family to support her whatsoever, except a family that lived in a junkyard in a trailer house. No offense to anybody that lives in trailer houses. In fact, I have lovely friends that live in trailer houses, and I just visited some in San Diego the other day. And yes, I sat on the couch and ate my, my 4th of July hot dog because there was no table. So I'm not above people that live in trailer houses. I'm just trying to paint a picture. The life that I was supposed to have was that I was going to be adopted by a lovely, open-minded family who traveled around the world and who were incredibly creative and very spiritual and visited many sacred sites and studied many spiritual philosophies. And I would have been educated in that fashion and I saw myself wearing the ubiquitous linen blouse and slacks and sandals standing at the front of a room much like this teaching people spiritual philosophy and working as a healer. But when I came face to face with the life that I was going, knowing that I was going to have, because now she had decided to keep me, I screamed to the Creator, no, I do not want this life. And we fought back and forth. And he said, you have to go. You have to go back. There's something important you have to do. And I fought with him. It must have been four or five times. This is going to be so horrible. Please don't let this happen to me. And I came back. And unfortunately, when I came back, my soul remembered that. And I was very angry. So I had the memory of anger. The memory, the cellular memory in my body of anger. And in my healing, I talked to people about the origination point of fear, the origination point of anger. 
And it's much like one of those little orange ping pong balls with a tiny strip of Velcro strapped around it that you see little kids flow, throwing at the little target on the wall. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, to me, anytime we experience fear or anger, frustration, greed, jealousy, disappointment, if there isn't something for it to stick to inside of us, is it, if there isn't something for it to attach to that's already existing there, it's much easier for us to let it go. But when there is fear or anger rooted inside of you, whether it's from the time you're in vitro or up until you're about seven or eight years old and you're taking on the experiences and the beliefs and the patterns of your mother and your father, generally speaking, you will have a more difficult time of letting things go if you don't have an energetic practice of clearing and releasing traumas. And that's what happened for me. I grew up in a, a my mother was married to an alcoholic um, when I was two or three, and I heard screaming from the bathroom, and I went running into the bathroom, and there was her first husband with her hair in his hands with a gun to her head. And in that moment, um, I believe that I was able to see a very negative energy. And I had already seen and experienced a lot of negativity around us. And my little girl mind constantly said, the memories that I have of my childhood are, I am not going to treat people like that when I grow up. I will never speak to a child like that when I grow up. I am going to learn how to do things differently when I grow up. And that seemed to be a theme. That I had a really long list of what not to do or how not to be, but very little to mirror in terms of being kind, loving, patient, and compassionate. So needless to say, <clears throat> There was uh, sexual abuse. I ran away a couple of times. I was tossed around from family to family member and eventually went out on my own when I was a, a teenager and got a job in Beverly Hills and I um, became an accountant. I worked my way up from clerking and entering uh, rental income on little index cards to the advent of the Lotus spreadsheet in the early 80s and then started using property management accounting software. And uh, then I worked my way up to be the controller of a real estate investment firm. And I realized at that time, without a college education, I was probably not ever going to make more than $60,000 a year, and that I needed to go to college. And I wanted to major in economics, and so I left um, work and I went to community college in West Los Angeles in California. And having had a lot of business experience, about 12 or 13 years of business experience, and starting from a very young age, college was very, very easy for me. And so I looked for hobbies. And one of the things I enjoyed doing from my childhood growing up in Pennsylvania was shooting. And so I became a competition shooter. I did speed shooting, and I did gunning and running type of uh, International Defensive Pistol Association type shooting, uh, rocking and rolling and hiding behind things and jumping under tables and, and that type of thing. And it was a lot of fun. And during that time, some gentleman in law enforcement approached me and said, here's my card. I think you would be very good in private security. If you're ever interested, please call me. And of course, I thought it was a joke. You know, the only thing I really knew was accounting and economics. And of course, I was majoring in economics, and I did quite well. And in college, I volunteered quite a bit, and I was in student government, and I worked on the student newspaper, and I was the treasurer, and I sat on the presidential advisory committee, 13 subcommittees, and I changed the way they taught math in all community colleges across the state of California. In fact, as my children grew up, they benefited from classes that never existed until I asked the curriculum committee to change the way they taught math. And they shifted 
a lot of the mathematics courses, introductory mathematics, um, for people who maybe didn't do well in skill, school, or older adults coming back to school and had a, a, been in school for a long time, there would be 30 or 35 people in class in the beginning of the semester, and then when it came time for the final, there would be three or four people sitting there, you know, and not everyone necessarily passed, but boy, did they try. Everybody tried. Um, and so what I did was I said, well, I think that ch kids need more tutoring, people, and grown adults, they need more tutoring, and so I worked in, um, I got grants to tutor people, especially at-risk uh, people. I tutored English as a second language for people that from other companies that were immigrating here that had PhDs in science and law in their countries, but were coming to the community college to learn conversational English. I tutored economics and I tutored history. And the mathematics classes that came out of that, they now call ABC classes in the California Community College District, where they take geometry or they take um, basic classes and they divide the book into three. So they allow in one semester for you to focus and have more attention from the teacher and to be able to go to the chalkboard, and now it's probably the whiteboard, and uh, to do, do more work, one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. And in the first couple of years, I did get some feedback that more than 600 people had successfully gone through those classes. So in my life, I have um, done a lot of advocacy work from the time I was young and even prior to my near-death experience. And we'll, we'll definitely get to that very shortly. Um, so, Eventually, I went ahead and I contacted the detective from LAPD, and he said that he owned a private security firm, and he thought that I would be very good in security, and I took him up on it, and I was introduced to some pretty well-known, influential former CIA, former FBI, former police chief type people, former military people from across the country who trained people in private security. And it took me two years, and it was very similar to the training that you go through, uh, that the Secret Service would go through. Um, needless to say, I dropped out of college at that point, and I never did finish my degree in economics. But I did have a solid foundation several years, several years, and um, a 3.7, I think, something GPA. So I did well when I was there. After two years, I began to work in the industry, and I was hired by a company called Vance International Security. And that company was owned by President Gerald Ford's daughter, Susan Ford, and her then-husband, Charles Vance, who was President Ford's secret service agent on his detail. And that is how he met President Ford's daughter. Eventually, they married, and when President Ford was no longer the president, uh, the Saudis funded to the tune of many millions of dollars his now son-in-law to launch his own private international security firm and there were three divisions private security, threat assessment and international security and um, uniform security so when Caterpillar or other large corporations would go on strike we would have a large uniform division that would respond and protect the, the corporate board members and officers, as well as the employees of the corporations. I worked in the field for uh, roughly three years. I protected the Queen of Saudi Arabia, the first granddaughter of the King of Saudi Arabia, the religious consultant to the King of Saudi Arabia and his family, and many others. It was a very high-stress environment, and I worked 14 to 16 hours a day seven days a week with no day off. There was a minimum requirement that when you went on a detail, you could not leave prior to 90 days, no matter what happened. I believe I did have a, a death in the family or something that I, I was able to go home for two days once. Um, there was a period of time where I began to become very weak and very tired, and my shooting scores were declining. I couldn't hold my weapon as well as I would like, and I was getting very fatigued, and I wasn't exercising regularly in the morning anymore. And as you can imagine, being a woman in the industry, there was a lot expected of me. I was expected to run 
and I was expected to run the stairs in the stadiums, and I was expected to lift weights, and I was expected to do everything the Special Forces, Army Ranger, Navy SEALs did. And these were my coworkers, highly specialized law enforcement personnel. A gentleman that stood at the front door of the White House, a young woman who stood at the door of Marine One when the President would board the helicopter to leave the White House. Um, a gentleman who carried the football for the president. The football is the metal case that carries the nuclear launch code. So I work with incredibly amazing people, and um, my business experience and the few years of college that I had helped me to achieve detailed leader status um, on, a, on a detail, and um, I rose uh, quite uh, rapidly and I was, I believe, very respected for what I did. And I, I think that I was very good at what I did. I uh, enjoyed it very much. In fact, I truly loved what I did. Um, coming from a girl who was born on a junkyard in Pennsylvania, to live in Boston at the Ritz-Carlton all summer, or the Four Seasons, or um, to travel on private planes to Hawaii, or at, you know, at a whim to Washington or Texas or, you know, Houston and shop in Houston or Florida, wherever it is that I um, was able to go, places I had never been before, it was quite fascinating. And even when you're standing by to stand by, as those former military men and women in the audience will note, that it can be quite a boring experience, being exposed to what I was exposed to was frankly quite thrilling. And I did not want to leave my career. I loved it very much. But I began experiencing pain. We uh, didn't know at the time, I will tell you now, though, that in 2015, long after my near-death experience, we finally discovered that what probably took me out was Lyme disease. So in 2015, I, somebody did suggest, had you ever had a blood test for Lyme disease? And I had not, and I did. And sure enough, I had the markers that at one time Lyme disease was active but that it was no longer active. So um, my fatigue and my pain, which was significant, it felt as if the bones and the long bones in my legs and my arms were just going to explode from the inside out. I uh, took some time off and I went to the one of the most well-known rheumatologists at Cedar Sider, Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Beverly Hills, California. And after he examined me, and I have to pause for just a moment and say, I'm sharing this piece about my medical journey and opioids on purpose. I wouldn't normally, and I know that you are mostly here to hear about my NDE, but I am in a hospital and I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity to speak out loud my experience with opioids so that it is in the walls and the ceiling and the floor and the equipment and every person that is in this building right now will vibrate with my experience. So I thank you for indulging me and thank you for being patient and allowing me to add this piece. I was sitting in uh, this man's office after he had examined me. I gotten dressed and gone into his office, and he said, well, Mrs. Jablonski, my assessment of you is that you are just simply a type A person who has burned out and you need some time off. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, if you haven't figured it out already, yes, I'm a type A person, and no, I do not burn out. Never have. Never will. That was more than I thought at the time. So I was really insulted. And to add insult to insult, as he said that, he handed me a prescription for hydrocodone. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. I carry a gun. I'm one of the few women at the time, it was my understanding, that had a concealed weapons permit in California. I'm not going to jeopardize that. And by the way, did you know I drive a car? I said that out loud to him. He pointed out the office window and said, 80% of LA is driving around on more medication than this. What's the matter with you? Once again, insulted, I said, I'm not here for drugs. I'm here to find out what's wrong with me. So please, figure it out and fix me back up because I'm going back to work. 
I didn't work very much after that. Um, a few times I would train um, high-risk details that would um, facilitate people who lived in one country but traveled across the border to work in another where it was very volatile, such as in the San Diego area where you, uh, executives would live in San Diego but work in factories or run corporations in northern Mexico. And so those are considered high-risk details. That's just one example. And that would take you know, three, four, five days at a time, and then I would have time off. It wasn't long, though, until I wasn't able to work anymore. I, I was just so fatigued and had such a significant level of pain that I did have to take myself off of active duty status. And very quickly, I qualified for Social Security disability income, which was a giant blow to my ego. I never thought that I would ever be a person who took advantage of public assistance. Not that there's anything wrong with it, I just thought I never would be a person who needed it, you understand. Mm -hmm. Over the next seven or eight years, I went back to this doctor time and time again, trying to get him to diagnose me. And of course I was misdiagnosed with many things, or there was the thought of, did you have ankylosing spondylitis, or multiple sclerosis, or is it lupus, or pardon me, what kind of autoimmune disorder you know, are we dealing with here, and incessant testing, and uh, a litany of non-narcotic uh, medication, one of which was methotrexate. Mm -hmm. And low-dose chemotherapy doesn't mean no-dose the chemotherapy, and it significantly declines your feeling of well-being, it significantly declines the quality of your um, mental health, quite frankly. Your, in that your willingness to try to get better, your sense of purpose in the world is degraded to the point where you are almost unrecognizable to yourself. So I was already there, having been on methotrexate quite a long time, when in 2009, he handed me a fentanyl lollipop and said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be your doctor anymore. I'm no longer going to try to figure out what's wrong with you. I can't help you, and this is your only option. I didn't know what fentanyl was, and um, I had mentioned earlier that I would forget to say really incredibly important things, and here's one of them. My husband and I believed that doctors knew everything. Mm -hmm. My husband has dual degrees. He attended both Caltech and UCLA, has dual degrees in computer science and electrical engineering, and we had never heard the term alternative healing modality. We believed the doctors knew everything, so we never looked outside of our house for answers. And I was frankly so embarrassed at the decline of the state of my being that I really didn't discuss it with anyone. And unfortunately, um, my children, of course, thought I was, you know, this happens with Lyme disease a lot. People around you don't think you're sick. They think that you're mentally ill. They think you're making it up, you know, and um, you lose your friends. You lose your self-respect. You lose your dignity really quick when that happens. So I took the fentanyl lollipop home to my husband and I handed it to him because he and I had had many, many conversations about me not wanting to take narcotics and what that would mean. So he grabbed the label, he got on the FDA website, and he really dramatically said, Ginny, you realize if you take this medication, your brain can forget to tell your lungs to breathe. That's exactly what happened four years later, but we're not there to the story yet. And I said, well, this is my only choice. And I just bawled and collapsed in his arms and said, what am I to do? By this point, he was carrying me to the bathroom. To get out of bed every morning, I rolled onto my knees, onto the floor, and pushed myself up refusing to take medication so long probably did me in a little faster 
because even though I had a high tolerance, a high threshold for pain, I was tough. The pain takes a toll as well. So we went ahead and started with the fentanyl, and the first night, my husband stayed up all night watching me breathe. Because I think he maybe misread the FDA website. I think he thought, if you take this the very first day, you could stop breathing. Maybe it has for some people, I don't know. But the first night, he did not get any sleep. He said he watched me breathe all night. And now thinking back in this moment on what I just said, if that wasn't portending the future, he knew something was going to go wrong. So. Taking the fentanyl is a very slippery slope. As we all know now, this medication makes you need more medication faster because it creates more pathways. Oh, there's so much pain. How is the brain going to interpret all this traffic? Let's just make more pathways for pain. So you just need more and more and more. Your body builds up a tolerance. You have more pain pathways. And even on the fentanyl, I average a, a, on the scale of 1 to 10. It starts with an M. I'm sure you know the name of the. This is my girlfriend, Kathy, by the way, from Chicago coming to. She, she's a nurse. Yeah. Emergency room. Um, there's a scale, that they, a scale of 1 to 10. What is your pain? You know, some people use happy faces, grimace face. Um, a scale of 1 to 10, my pain was um, like a 7 or 8, sometimes a 9, even on the fentanyl. So every six months or so, we would increase it another 25 micrograms. And just about a month before my NDE, we were sitting, I was sitting in the doctor's office, and he was writing me a new prescription for 135 <coughs> micrograms of fentanyl per hour. And I said to him, boy, gee, this sounds like a lot of medicine, and at the time I weighed 110, 115 pounds, are you sure this is safe? And he says, oh, Mrs. Jablonski, don't worry. I have surgeons and judges on more medication than this. If that makes anybody in this room feel good, I will be shocked. <coughs> surgeons operating on human beings, <laughs> on 135 micrograms of fentanyl, I didn't drive a car. For two years, I stopped driving at night because I saw things. I was seeing, <laughs> hallucinating. And then in the daytime, I turned left onto not a street, a parked car. But it's okay for a surgeon to operate <laughs> on 135 micrograms of fentanyl? <laughs> and a judge to adjudicate a court case to decide what's going to happen to someone for the rest of their life? You lose your ability to reason. I am a walking billboard for that. I, I cannot begin to tell you how it degrades your faculties. And more importantly, it takes your will to live with it. It takes all the fight right out of you. So, just a few short weeks after that new prescription, I go to bed on the night before my 47th birthday. And it's after midnight sometime. And I am sort of awake, and I feel someone at my shoulders and my feet, and I thought it seemed quite odd, but before I had the presence of mind to really think about it very long, I was immediately transported out of my body into a space of white light, no ceiling, no floor, no walls, and there was a very large green deciduous tree, looked very much like a, like a a cross between a maple and an oak, I, I can't say the species. And there was a man standing in front of me, and the only way I can describe him is, I'm pretty sure it was Jesus. 
because just about any picture anybody's ever seen of Jesus, a very handsome man with dark hair, about shoulder length, beautiful blue eyes, wearing a linen tunic with a, a royal blue sort of over tunic tied with a very simple rope and sandals. So I don't know if it was him, but it sure looked like Jesus to me. And he held out his hand, and he said, You've suffered enough. Your life is over. Come with me. And I had, in that moment, the most ironic thought that I've ever had in my entire life. But who will take care of my husband? By this time, my husband did the dishes, did the grocery shopping, brought me three meals a day, worked full time, you know, took care of everything. And the first thing that comes to my mind, which I guess, you know, stating the obvious, I had a mind still at this point, standing in front of Jesus. I was, I was aware in my consciousness that this was happening. Who's going to take care of my husband? And I, I, he didn't say it, but I was very much aware that I had a choice. And in the back of my mind, I always kind of knew that I had to do something important, but I had no idea what it was. And I will tell you why in a few moments, because I, of course, forgot a few important events in my life. But I was holding his hand, and I heard a little rustling behind me, and I looked behind me, and sure enough, there were a number of horses and donkeys that I had been volunteering with at a sanctuary prior to my death. And I inadvertently left out that entire part of my journey as well. And we, we can talk about that later if you'd like. And the donkeys were braying and screaming, and the horses were rearing up on their hind legs, whinnying loudly, just, don't go, don't go. Don't you remember? There's something important you have to do. And very quickly, I turned to Jesus and I said, sorry, Jesus, I'm going with them. And I, as I came back into my body, I had a vision of, and I don't know if it was me, but I had a vision of someone sitting on a white horse, um, sort of like a Joan of Arc kind of idea, with um, a very Renaissance type, military type, uniform, Knights Templar looking sort of thing, but I can't really identify it. And the horse had um, a beautiful cover on it, and the person was holding like a jousting lance, but a staff. And it, it just came in for just a, a quick second, and then I was back in my body. And I just started screaming, and my lungs filled up with air, and my lungs were on fire on fire and at the same time it felt like somebody was sitting on my heart because my heart had stopped beating there was no oxygen in my lungs my lungs were filling up my I don't know if my I don't know what it feels like because I never had a heart attack but when your heart stops beating and it starts again it, it definitely hurt it was really really scary and I started screaming and screaming and screaming and I woke my husband up in quite a fright and um, I was just screaming, I just died, I just died, I just died. I must have screamed it 20 times. And so my husband startled and said, well, are you okay now? Do, I need, do we need to go to the hospital? And I said, no, I'm okay. I think I'm perfectly fine. And he goes, well, if you're perfectly fine, can we talk about it in the morning? <laughs> that always gets a bit loud. <laughs> and I said, sure. And I laid there awake the rest of the night, you know, just up and down, up and down, going to the bed, walking around the house, just waiting for him to get up and have his coffee so we could have a nice, sane conversation about it. And um, so when he had had his coffee, I, he was sitting in his office chair. He worked at home. And I got on my knees in, in front of him on the chair, and I said, honey, I died last night. And I don't want to die. I'm not ready to die. At least not yet. And he said, I don't care what it takes. I don't want you to die either. 
and I had no idea what that meant. <coughs> But I called my pain management doctor that day and made an appointment for the next day to go back to get my prescription changed. So I go back to the pain management doctor and I say, the medicine is going to kill me. I need to get off of this medicine. How do I do it? Oh, Mrs. Jablonski, nobody ever gets off of opioids. <laughs> I have thousands of patients, and one or two may have decreased their dosage, but nobody ever gets off. You'll just eventually die. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that, so please decrease the prescription. And he did, begrudgingly, and it was noted in the medical record that it was against medical advice. Um, so, I went on a really crazy, uh, unique, emotionally charged journey for about a year, bringing myself off of medication because, remember, I believed that doctors had the answer to everything and I didn't know that there were people that you could go to for help. And so my husband and I just sort of toughed it out on our own. And I ran around the house hysterical, like my hair was on fire. <laughs> you know, I couldn't breathe some days, and I had panic attacks, and I was coming off of a considerable amount of opioids. But we did get there. And in that process, I researched alternative healing modalities, and I found different healers and meetings and um, webinars and downloads and seminars and you know all kinds of interesting stuff. But when that happened, I didn't even know what a chakra was. I didn't know, what, really, I had no experience with yoga. I think once in my life at my gym, they had a yoga class. I didn't know what it was. Um, so everything was really new to me. And I started on a journey of going to people that maybe probably weren't the right ones to help me. Maybe at a certain time on my journey, they might have been able to help me. There was a physical therapist who I went to two or three times a week for six months. And I don't know how he got the insurance companies to pay for it, but I would lay on a table and he would have his hands on my body and he would sit there and not say anything for an entire hour. And that was his version of energy healing, which wasn't what you need when you have PTSD and you're coming off of drugs. You know, that's a little either advanced, and that's why it didn't work for me, or maybe what he was doing wasn't working, I don't know. But after six months of paying for that, I then realized, um, and by the way, I was paying cash um, because physical therapy, of course, as we all know that our medical health professionals, they only pay for one part of your body. So if your elbow hurts, you can have physical therapy for your elbow, or if you got a hip replacement, you can have physical therapy for your hip, but you can't have physical therapy for your whole entire body. That just doesn't happen. So when I did get off of the opioids, and this will be the last piece of the opioid journey, when I did get off of the opioids, I went back to my pain management doctor and I said, okay, I did it. I'm off of the opioids. What do I do now? And I will never forget this statement for the rest of my life. <laughs> Mrs. Jablonski, there are no protocols for overcoming the long-term effects of opioid use because there are no studies on the long-term effects of opioid use because nobody ever lives long enough to study them." And I can't help you. So I started to try to go to other doctors, medical doctors, um, physical therapists, chiropractors. Can you help me? I was bedridden for eight to nine years. I'm having a hard time using my body. And oh, by the way, my brain doesn't work anymore either. My vocabulary, my spontaneous speech, is not what it was. You can tell I'm speaking very simply today. I used to be a very compelling, spontaneous speech maker. And I did a lot in those years when I wasn't working, when I was being misdiagnosed for years before I was on opioids. I volunteered and I did a lot of amazing stuff. And um, I lobbied congressmen, I lobbied county supervisors, I lobbied congressmen in um, in Washington, D.C., and in Sacramento, and California. I did a lot of amazing, interesting, wonderful things with my time, 
But over time, opioids really stole that away from me. So that was my last experience with my pain management doctor being told that there are no studies on the long-term effects of opioid use. So do you think that the FDA warning label on fentanyl says that anywhere? So thank you all for being so incredibly patient and allowing me to share that portion of my medical journey. I think that we are probably supposed to take a break now, and when we come back, I will, I will happily and eagerly share my spiritual journey with you. I had two and a half, what, what I as refers to as spiritually transformative experiences. We either don't know or can't really say if we left our body, if we, you know, so it's not an out-of-body experience, but it's something that was really, really impactful and had a significant, um, pardon me for using the same word again, impact on my life. One of those was in 1996, and I was riding on the back of a motorcycle, going about, you know, 90, 95 on the freeway, and it felt as if I was holding on to the driver in front of the driver's waist, and I was holding my hands together in some way, and it felt almost as if someone grabbed one of my hands and ripped it off. And so... I'm falling backwards off the motorcycle, going 90-ish miles an hour, 95 on, and the turbulence is pulling my body. And I'm looking, looking back at the giant black sedan that I'm about to meet with my face. And I'm sliding off the seat, and I have a giant helmet on, so I could have screamed, it didn't matter. But it sort of happened in slow motion, and I was really resolved, I was just unusually calm about it. Well, I guess this is where I'm going to die, right on the windshield of that big black sedan. And I, I felt my left hand that was somewhat still around the driver's waist slipping off of his waist. And I was coming off of the seat. And out of nowhere, a giant invisible hand came and propelled me back onto the motorcycle, and my arms swung back around, and I had my hands clasped together. It wasn't my husband that was driving the motorcycle. It was a friend of ours, and I didn't tell the friend of ours because I didn't. Th I thought when we got off the motorcycle, didn't you notice I was falling off the motorcycle? And he didn't, and I thought he would never <coughs> believe me. Um, but when I got home, I did tell my husband about that. And we would think about it, talk about it from time to time, and say, oh, well, there must be a reason you're alive. But I could never figure it out, because I was just a regular person like everybody else, living the dream, you know, making money every month to pay the rent, just like everybody else. And um, two years later, I was driving my car in the fast lane, again, on a freeway in Los Angeles. This time I was in San Bernardino County, near, just, just west of San Bernardino. And I was going about 85 miles an hour in the fast lane, and my husband called me on the phone. And he was telling me that he needed to have surgery because he had um, something wrong with him. And I'm very hypersympathetic, and I started passing out. Uh, basal vega oh. type of a <coughs> and my vision started to go and I started to get weak and I looked over and it's a four lane highway and next to me was the cab of a semi truck yeah, I could see his door and in front of him was the giant cab of another semi truck and in front of him was the cab of another semi-truck. And right in front of that cab, as we're going 85 miles an hour, I could see the off-ramp. Well, I knew in that split second, I couldn't floor it and get in front of those three semi-trucks and get off the off-ramp. And I thought, well, this is where I'm gonna die. And my vision went, and I tried, and I'm trying to gun it, 
you know? And I think I got in front of one or more of the semi-trucks, I don't know, but I dropped the phone and I slumped down in my seat. And according to my husband and my cell phone, I woke up about 15 or 20 minutes later in the McDonald's parking lot off of that off-ramp. <laughs> and I don't know what happened in between. Wow. Now, when I have shared this story before, in 2014, a lovely woman from France said that she had a vision when I told the story to her and she saw an angelic arm reach down and pick up my car and put it in the parking lot. <laughs> and I have had other um, people that read the Akashic Records give me another version. And my body, the cellular memory, this is kind of crazy, this is kind of out there, so I hope I'm not pushing anybody's boundaries here. Or maybe it's good if I push your boundaries, I don't know. But I feel that in my body that I actually crashed and that my car went over the center divider and a horrible accident ensued and a lot of people were injured and damaged. That's just a memory that I have in my body. Now, is it another lifetime? Are there parallel realities and parallel timelines? I don't know. I'm not the one who will stand here and tell you how the universe works. But that is my second spiritually transformative experience. Now, the definition of spiritually transform transformative experience must, by virtue of the language, include spiritual transformation. <laughs> but I was not spiritually transformed. So it was an STE, but I didn't wake up, and I didn't go to a bookstore, and I didn't buy a crystal, and I didn't buy any stage, <laughs> and I didn't learn what a chakra was, and I didn't pray to God <coughs> any more than I ever did. <coughs> so technically, according to IANS, they're spiritually transformative experiences. However, I was not transformed. I just have to be honest about that. Did I think there was a reason, and did my husband believe at this point there was a reason I had to be alive for some reason? We just speculated it was because I have two amazing daughters. One now has, a, they don't talk to me, by the way. They think I'm crazy. And they never really got over the whole Lyme's disease thing. And I didn't go to their recitals and their plays and everything because I couldn't get out of bed. And so and still not talking to me. Um, and I'm working on it. I really am. I am trying really hard to make myself a better person and to be forgiving and loving so that there is a space for them to be forgiving and loving to me. Nevertheless, um, my husband and I did think, well, it must be because our kids are going to do something miraculous one day. And maybe that's very true. My oldest daughter has a master's degree in social work, and she's very successful working for a nonprofit. And my youngest daughter is a professional singer and has a degree in theater and music. And they're, they're both lovely people, and I, I think I did my very best to raise them, and they, I'm very proud of them, um, even if they don't like me. <laughs> Maybe one day they'll watch this video on YouTube and get that message, I don't know. So, the, I had said that I had two and a half spiritually transformative experiences. The half is an experience that I'm not really sure what happened in it, but it's about a year before my NDE my major NDE, which we just discussed, and it was about, so around the 2012 time period. And I was volunteering at a horse sanctuary, and I, uh, because my, one of my horses that I was not already able to care for, personally I had placed in a sanctuary near my house, and I went to the sanctuary every day for a very long period of time, like a year and a half before I, before I had my experience. And I would just brush horses and donkeys for two or three hours, or muck stalls, and um, to just go home and collapse, and, that, and that's all I did. Well, one day I was with my horse, I still considered him my horse, and um, just sort of hanging out with him, and I turned around, and you know in the old Western movies where the Native Americans line up in a semicircle on top of the hill, they give you a message, trouble's coming, you know? There were 13 horses lined up just like that in front of me in a perfect semicircle, perfectly spaced, 
And yes, I was on opioids, but this really happened. <laughs> and I know it really happened because I stood there and I said, nobody's ever going to believe this. I must be crazy. And they were just looking at me. And I know now, looking back in hindsight, now I'm, you know, I am able to energetically sort of feel into that experience and know what happened. And so I can tell you that, but what happened in that moment was I stood there looking at them and they were looking at me and I felt pretty weird. <laughs> and, and I thought nobody would ever believe this and so I just walked away. <laughs> now, in tapping into it energetically and reflecting on that energy, <clears throat> I, I feel I was transported to a place where the entire soul family of all horses exist. Mm -hmm. And I was told, you're going to die. Don't. We need you to do, oh, I chills right now. We need you to do something. Please don't die. Aware at the time I was probably on 90 or 100 micrograms of fentanyl, so I don't I don't have a conscious memory of that. But in my NDE, when the donkeys and horses were screaming, "Don't go! Don't you remember? There's something we need you to do." And of course, I didn't remember. And then the next morning, when I told my husband I died, again, I didn't remember it had anything to do with animals. I just so desperately wanted to live that I had to call the doctor and reduce my prescription and start researching. I, and I, at the time, I didn't know the word alternative. So healing, you know, and all these psychics were popping up and just whatever pops up on Google, I tried it. And, um, you know, I think one of the, it was a psychic lady that lived in a really bad part of Phoenix. And, like, within six days, my husband drove me there and dropped me off. And he goes, I don't think I'm going, I'm, I'm not going to go to the coffee shop and read a book. I'm sitting right here. Because it was a really bad neighborhood. But it, she was a psychic on Google. So I went in and um, she told me that I should hang some wind chimes and put some salt under my bed. And I'm sorry, but none of that stuff ever worked for me. If it works for you, great. I love it, you know. I think we give power to things. We give power to lots of things. And our intention is all that matters. And if our intention is that it works, it works. Well, I knew nothing about anything. And I was willing to try anything because I wanted to live so desperately. So I kissed a lot of frogs, took a lot of left turns, made a lot of silly mistakes that I would never encourage anybody to learn. But as we all know in this room, you never learn from somebody else's mistakes. So have at it. Try anything and see what works for you. See what resonates. You know, what always resonated for me was, and this came much later, forgiveness, love, and compassion. In the beginning, I didn't find a lot of it, and I think it was by design. I think I had to go through this journey on purpose. I had to come back not healed. I had to come back worse, almost, and not healed. Having touched Jesus' hand, being in some way gifted or downloaded with some sort of Christ universal energy, and having it be so incredibly incompatible with everything that I was. Trauma, drama, victim, angry, disempowered, <laughs> pain-ridden, weak. No words that you would use to describe me today. Not one of you would describe me in that way. I'm sure of it because I talked to a lot of you during the break. So, a lot of people come back from their NDEs fully healed, or with answers, or a plan, and I didn't. And I think, again, I think it was by design, because I had to go on this really tumultuous, circuitous, wacky journey <coughs> to be able 
to stand in front of you and answer questions about 20 or 30 healing modalities and 10 or 12 spiritual philosophies. Respectfully, all of which are very deep well and take years and years to master or fully understand. And I have not dedicated the time that it would take to fully internalize Buddhism, Shintoism, Judaism, Islam. But I've studied just enough and frankly spent a, more than a quarter of a million dollars on this journey. It was a full-time job. I dedicated myself to it every minute of the day. I have not taken a vacation from healing myself since my near-death experience on my 47th birthday. I added up the time, about six months or so, I went back in my journals and I've clocked about 13,000 hours of learning, studying, traveling, attending workshops, being certified in healing modalities both for humans and more recently for animals. And I think I had to have all that experience to figure out what works for me because what I had was complex PTSD and trauma. So I can speak to people who need that information. It doesn't mean that if you have complex PTSD and trauma, my journey and my solutions are your solutions, but there will most likely be more things that we have in common, more things that either will work or are helpful to you. It's not for everybody. My journey's not for everybody. My message is not for everybody. I understand it. <coughs> Tens of thousands more documented NDEs. Many, many ways to think, to feel, to perceive what healing means, what healing is. And for me, it was never effective to pay somebody $500 and lay on their table for an hour and say, heal me, baby, I'm ready. It didn't work for me. I hope it works for someone else. I'm sure it has in the past. I know because I've read so many phenomenal stories about miraculous healing and shifts in all of the different healing modalities I studied. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gone down each of these roads. But there's a reason why I've taken my name off of so many websites as being a certified healer in certain practices. Because I don't use them anymore and I don't promote them as a way to overcome trauma, trapped emotions, limiting belief systems that prevent us from healing ourselves and moving forward. So rather than me sort of give you 13,000 hours, you know, blow by blow, I think what's really fun and exciting is, is to answer questions and and talk about it a little bit. And if your question provoke um, some, a piece of the story that I haven't shared, then I can do a little bit of more of the story, but I would really love to answer questions if anybody has some. Um, yes? When, when we talked and we were going out for the break, can you indicate there's a connection or something to do with Lyme and cancer? Is there anything you want to talk more about that? Oh, her question is, during the break we spoke, and um, she misunderstood something I said, so yeah, she's yeah. asking, did I say that Lyme disease and cancer have a connection? And I apologize, I did not mean to say that. I, what I meant to say, and I think I did, was that with respect to the cancer, there'll be something for, helpful for you in the second piece. There'll be a connection in what I have to say in the second piece. And I will share that now. Okay. So there is a doctor in Germany. His name is Dr. Reich, R-Y-K-E, Geerd, G-E-E-R-D, Hammer, H-A-M-M-E-R. He was an oncologist in Germany, and he studied 20,000 cancer patients. Every single one of his 20,000 cancer patients answered questions in the same exact way. The questions primarily were, do you have any unresolved emotional issues or family trauma? 
Can you imagine creating a giant spreadsheet of your 20,000 cancer patients and they're all grouped together by type of cancer or subcategory of <coughs> cancer and asking every person, do you have an unresolved emotional trauma, family trauma, and what is the nature of that? All of the answers in the category of a specific cancer were very, very similar. The frequency of unresolved, unforgiveness, anger, disappointment, missed opportunities, jealousy, greed, frustration, doubt, you name it, there's about 140 or more negative thoughts and emotions feelings that I have identified in my work, which psychotherapists use in their work, in the EMDR modality, which is where you hold the two little metal paddles and it vibrates the electromagnetic vibration, left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, as you go back into the memory of your trauma in your past and rewrite it. Now, some of the things that I have learned and realized, I think would really benefit those psychotherapists and um, counselors who are using those modalities. Because rewriting is not exactly what I have found to be <coughs> as effective as going into that moment and forgiving yourself and forgiving our perceived perpetrator, or in some cases, co-conspirator. So Dr. Reich Geert Hammer, he was, believe it or not, expelled from Germany due to the efficacy of his research. So he's now, I believe in Italy, partnering, I think it's Italy, pardon me if I'm wrong, partnering with 100 medical doctors to recreate his research so that it can be published in using the scientific method. So that it can be peer-reviewed science and more accepted in Europe. So, that doesn't mean that we do not get cancer, and I don't want to project any reason for anybody being ill today in my talk, it doesn't mean that it's not possible to get cancer from environmental factors or genetic factors. I personally believe those genetic factors are rooted in the unresolved emotional trauma and history of the ancestral lineage, however. So, if we live in a city where there's an aluminum factory, is there a high probability that higher than numbers of people will get a certain type of cancer? That's a scientific fact. Unfortunately, there's no scientific evidence today that if you're in a family with a lot of drama and trauma, that you have a higher probability of getting cancer. But I believe that that is very true. Is it true that some people don't? Yes, of course. Can I say exactly why? No, I cannot tell you how the universe works or why. I can only share my experience. Is that helpful with respect to the cancer? I appreciate that. There is a famous woman. Her name is Carolyn Mace. It is spelled M-Y-S-S. -S. She's written several books. The one I would like to call attention to is called the anatomy of the spirit. In that book, she compares um, the tree of life as presented through Buddhism, Christianity, and Kabbalah, or Judaism. And she talks about her experience in the 80s being a psychic medium, or medical intuitive, more appropriately, medical intuitive. During that time, she struck up a phenomenal friendship 
with a famous osteopathic doctor who now works at the University of Arizona, and his name is Dr. Andrew Wheel. I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with him. He worked together with her for 10 years, and he would call on her with difficult cases, and he would ask her, what do you think is going on with this person? In her book, in the first one or two chapters, it talks about a young man who Dr. Wheel believed had pancreatic cancer, but yet the blood test returned a negative result. And she said, if he doesn't change his life within two weeks, he will have pancreatic cancer. He has the frequency, he has the vibration of pancreatic cancer in his body and it will solidify in his pancreas in two weeks if he doesn't quit his job and change his life. And sure enough, the young man did not quit his job or change his life. And he did, within a matter of months, test positive for that disease, and he did quickly pass. I really recommend this book. She has written several other really interesting books. She doesn't act as a medical intuitive any longer. She gives classes that sound very much like the way I talk. And I found out about her much later in my career. In fact, only a couple of months ago did I read her, the first book of hers that I read. But when I read that book, as well as reading a couple of others, I said to myself, well, why did I go to Australia and work with Aborigines and shaman from Brazil and Native American masters and do all this stuff when I could have read a 1395 book? <laughs> you know, what is that all about? And it's all about being able to stand here today and legitimately say to you, all of you and everybody that I ever meet, I have experience with many philosophies and many healing modalities. And the universe probably didn't put you in front of me unless you're going to resonate with something I have to say today. Mm -hmm. And you can look on my website and read many, many, many lengthy testimonials about how lives can be changed, how we can reconnect with our purpose, how we can wake up in the morning and not have the negative thoughts. How we can change our behavior patterns, almost what seems like automagically. I had a beautiful thought in my mind and it just went away, so maybe it's time for me to stop talking and I know that there's an Do you communicate with your horse? Do I communicate with my horse? Yes. So that's another really incredible piece that I didn't share. After my near-death experience, both my husband and I thought I was crazy, and we thought it was probably because of the opioids, most likely, because I could see energy, but I didn't know what energy was. So imagine you've never heard about meridians, chakras, or the nervous system, and you woke up one day, and I could see all 40 miles of nerves in your body, and your chakras all distorted, and your Chinese meridians, all at once. And dead people were talking to me, and ants were talking to me, and trees were talking to me. So it was all kind of crazy making, if you will. And I didn't understand it, and I didn't believe in it, and I never knew anybody could do this. And so I just thought it was the drugs, and if I could just get off the drugs, I could go back to being a normal person if I ever really was a, a normal person. So, yes ma'am, I do work with animals. My journey, however, for me was initially about my own healing. I had to go on my own healing journey. journey. And on that healing journey, over a period of three years or so, I met a lot of really incredible healers. And long about the third year of my journey, they started telling me, you know, you're a healer. And I kind of knew it because about that time, every time I would go to a, a healer, I'd be laying on their table, and in my mind I would think, I can do what they're doing, but I can do it better. 
or I know why it's not working. Or they, they're adding a piece that if they took that piece out, there's a piece limiting it. And I started to think in my mind, why am I paying everybody to do stuff that I know I can do? But of course, you have no faith, you have doubt, you have all these limiting beliefs. And also, I was not in a position to help anybody. I knew it. First of all, I would have been a total and complete fraud in my own eyes. Because I hadn't healed myself, and I was still mad at my mom for being abusive and all of the crazy things that happened to me. I was still angry. I, in my mind, I was still a victim. So I didn't think I had the right, really, to look you in the eyes, sir, and tell you that I think I have something important to offer you. Because I really wasn't healed myself. And people kept saying, no, no, you, you're a healer. I think you have a message for my, you know, my client. And it's true, I was, that, you know, animals were talking to me, and people were talking to me, and dead people were coming, and it was beautiful. And I would say all kinds of interesting things in my healing sessions, but to me, I wanted to make sure that I clearly not complete my own healing journey, because do not hear me say I am <coughs> done take me out of the oven, I'm not. <laughs> But I wanted to at least get to a certain point where I felt that I don't, you know, I don't overreact. I'm coming from a place of love and not judgment. I mean, it's really hard to get to that place. It's really hard. And in the spiritual community, one of the things I experienced was a tremendous amount, and I'm sorry for being honest, of spiritual arrogance. How many people did I go to and they said, it's my way or the highway, I'm right, and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> Stick with me. Work with me. A lot of people wanted me to bring information forward so they could do something with it or write a book. Because after my NDE, and I didn't find this out until last year, somehow the connection to the other side was left really wide open. <coughs> and I was getting a lot of information that maybe wasn't in my highest good and was quite frankly distracting to get. And yes, it helped other people, but it probably slowed down my journey a little bit. Now, did I have amazing experiences because of it? Yes. Am I going to criticize my journey? No. And I encourage no one to criticize any experience that they have because it's true that it makes us who we are. And it's true that it's valuable. If not a lesson for you, it will be helpful for someone someday. I promise you. Okay, I, I'm hoping I'm not stopping in the middle of a, of a point. Is it, was there another question? Oh, I have a question. Um, so you, um, you mentioned that you took your name off of a lot of certifications that mm -hmm. you were, um, that you learned. Mm -hmm. um, is there, so what does work, if, you know? So I, I don't want to give, uh, I don't want to criticize any healing modality specifically. So I'm not going to give you any specific modalities. Mm -hmm. But let me just give you some ideas of things. It didn't work for me. It doesn't mean it might not work for you. But I found energetically, because after I woke up, I could see energy. So I know when somebody's doing a healing on somebody and energy leaves, and then you're sitting around talking or whatever and you know paying the bill, and then as the person walks out the door, the energy comes right back to the person. So why would that be, for example, in a Reiki session or something like that? Now, Reiki is so ubiquitous, and I happen to be a Reiki master myself, which is something that I don't um, divorce myself from, however, I am very vocal about the fact that I never accepted an attunement, and I do not use symbols. Modalities, not necessarily Reiki, but there were many modalities that, and people that want to upgrade you, oh, we're ascending, we're transcending, you need your DNA upgraded, give me $5,000, <laughs> I have the codes to ascension, give me $3,000 for part one, and $4,000 for part two, because I used to work for NASA, and I have the codes to ascension, that's not organic. <laughs> Downloading 
There's a lot of people that want to download information to you. That want you to create sacred geometry around your body and install an antenna in your energy construct. That's not organic. Anything that is inorganic never helped me and in fact did cause some harm to the integrity of my energy construct. That's my experience. And I must be honest about it. Yes. Um, you had mentioned something about uh, your your Akashic records. And did you in the, early in your talk? Oh, yes, somebody? the gentleman that I went to to read the Akashic records mentioned something about when I was driving the car. Right. So have you gone into that part of metaphysical and the Akashic records, or me myself reading the Akashic right, records? Right. Or some of the healing, because that's you know there's a lot of healers that access that in terms of of helping somebody. Mm -hmm. And that kind of information can be very empowering and very helpful. Um, it's important to be very, if, you, if your intention is to heal, be very deliberate in the questions that you ask, that it doesn't slip into more of an entertaining conversation. Um, and I will share an experience for me. So in the beginning, Everybody wants to tell you, oh, you were Joan of Arc in a past life, or you're a Mary Queen of Scots, or you were Catherine the Great in Russia. Or, everybody wants to tell you this whole thing. Well, first of all, it's really important for all of us to know that we weren't the only one, because we have soul groups or soul families, and, and everybody on Earth has memories of pretty much everything. And I have a lot of clients that believe they were Mother Mary. I was Mother Mary. I wrote a book about being Mother Mary. I have the memories. So do a lot of people, but you, some people, you know, some people are so invested in that, you know. Um, well, in the beginning, I I had a lot of this. People were trying to tell me, well, you did this and you did that, and you're here because you know you have a strong sense of justice and you know, etc. It wasn't until I went to Australia and worked with an Aboriginal woman that I understood why this information can be so helpful. And in that two hour experience with her, I realized it's not about entertainment. It's about identifying the opportunities to heal the patterns that exist that are creating our reality. So if, for example, she helped me to see a particularly difficult life that I had where I was not a nice man not a nice man, and I died believing I was right. And in the hereafter, I was shaking my fist. Uh, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. My entire, the mutiny of the ship, which actually was a spaceship, but it was still a ship. They, they, you know, I was not in control anymore. I got kicked out of the government. I did some horrible thing. But what I realized is that was a tremendous opportunity for healing and clearing and releasing so that part of me could be reintegrated with me. So I think there is a tremendous amount of information, a, a phenomenal amount of information that can be used for healing, for learning, for growing. Unfortunately, in the beginning, I didn't know that, and a lot of people took advantage of me. And for three or five hundred, or even there are people who charge a thousand dollars an hour to read the Akashic Records. They will sit and entertain you all day long, and you are made no better for it. And this is my message. There are, as Diane famously says, there are a hundred ways to heal. And not all ways are appropriate for every single person. For me, certain modalities were appropriate in the beginning, but you kind of grow out of it, right? and you're ready for more, you're hungry for more, <clears throat> or your next level of healing necessitates a higher level of understanding, or a deeper level of understanding <clears throat> of the origins of the distortion, the frequency that sits <clears throat> in your liver because you're angry, because your son died when he was 12, and you never forgave God, and now you have liver cancer. 
And that happened to my uncle. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to ask if, without using the phrase, it depends, uh, can you describe in one sentence how the healing process works? Yes. This is my perspective is that everything we are is energy and frequency. We have organs and glands and tissues and 11 processes of the body. Respiratory, circulatory, the hormones. We also have an energetic construct. We have chakras and we have subtle bodies, layers of the auric field, which correspond to our chakras. Certain energies and certain frequencies can be categorized into, let's say, for example, you're really into pranic medicine or Hinduism or Buddhism, which have a different idea of the number of chakras and overall larger number of smaller chakras in the body. So for example, the Buddhists believe there are four chakras, but overall, I think it's roughly 800. But the Hindus believe that there are seven primary, and of course the number is growing as you become more aware of the cosmology of the universe and that we have a higher self point and that we have a, what's known as the well of dreams and there are other uh, names for that. And then there are people talk about having planetary, lunar, cosmic, you know, galactic, you name it. Um, if you really study the chakras and the, the, the philosophy about the chakras, the chakras represent feelings and beliefs about our life. So for example, just you're wearing red, so both choose the root chakra. So the root chakra is about the foundation of our life. What country are we born into? What culture are we born into? What religion are we born into? What cultural history and beliefs have we recently gone to a war in our ancestral lineage? Right? How do we relate? How do we fit in? What piece of the puzzle are we on this flying blue marble called Earth? So we have energies associated with that, thoughts associated with that with that, feelings associated with that, memories of war, of conflict, of religious persecution. So, in chronic medicine, you can buy a you know, really thick book for $150 that talk all about the chakras and the corresponding organs to that chakra. And the frequencies of these experiences, doubt, shame, grief, guilt, Right? And how do those frequencies of those feelings, those emotions, those experiences come in through our energy field if we don't have a practice to manage our own energy each day? It spins in our chakra and eventually solidifies into one of or many of the corresponding organs and glands. Healing takes place in the reverse. We identify that conflict or distortion or unforgiveness or shame or blame or jealousy. And we dig deep in our meditation. For some people, meditation works. For some people, yoga works. Simply meditating and simply doing yoga was not a solution for me with complex PTSD and trauma. I'm not saying it won't work for someone else, but this is what I know works for people with trauma. When you deliberately meditate on clearing the distortion or the unforgiveness or the shame, or you meditate with the intention to connect with your soul and ask your soul to show you the source of the patterns in your life. If you're always having difficulty, if you're falling and you're breaking your bones, if you're crashing your car on the way to an important event, if you didn't get the job you wanted, if you're married three times and all three times your divorce ended for you know, a divorce, which I'm, I'm just, for most of us would be horrible. I apologize for saying it that way. If we're 
repeating patterns, patterns of behavior, patterns of speech, patterns of thought, and you meditate, and you ask your soul to show you what is the source of that pattern? Where is it coming from? And you identify it to be when you were two years old and you were playing with your dad in the yard and he was a handyman and you really were enjoying time with dad and then all of a sudden he accidentally dropped a hammer on your foot. And so the little two-year-old you says, playing with dad is not safe. But it's a subconscious frequency in your mind that we're not consciously aware of. But there's always something there that's affecting how you feel around your dad. And you tap into that, and you go back into that moment, because the, how many trillion cells are there in the human body today? They're saying 300 trillion cells in the human body. <coughs> Every one of those cells remembers that hammer dropping on your foot when you're playing with that. Now, you might not have a conscious memory of it, but you have a subconscious memory of it. So you meditate and you say, why is it I always feel kind of queasy or anxious when I'm going to see my dad? And one day you're shown, oh, when I was a little boy, dad dropped a hammer on my foot. I'm not saying you don't love your dad. Just that there's this energy that sort of percolates when we're around. And so your soul shows you, and you go back and you say, oh, gee, dad. I know you didn't mean to drop that hammer on my foot, and I'm so sorry that I reacted to you innocently dropping that hammer on my foot, and I forgive you, and I forgive myself for taking on the belief that I'm not safe around my father. And when you do that with the intention to release the cellular memory and all of the corresponding residual energy of that frequency, if you believe that everything is energy, all thought, all emotions is energy, and you truly intend to release that and forgive your father and forgive yourself, it will release. Would you like another description, or does that make sense to you? Good, thank you. And it gets a lot deeper than that. <laughs> because there's memories right now of so many people of Vietnam and World War II, and even for some of us of World War I, and the hundred wars really that have taken place in this cent last century that most people don't even know we participated in. So um, the Crusades, for example, that's an easy one to pull out of thin air. Religious persecution. How many times have we all been healers in past lives? and we've been accused of being a charlatan, or we've been falsely accused of a crime that we didn't commit just so that they could get us out of the way, or we've been hung or beheaded or stoned to death, or whatever. And so in this life, we're like, are you my friend? Hell no. I'm not going to open up that pathway to that information and that healing ability and that knowing that I am that powerful, that I can heal myself with number one, being self-aware, and number two, my loving intention? Because guess what? It freaks people out around us. They don't like us to be that powerful. It's happening all across the world right now, just with herbalists and homeopaths and osteopaths and, and naturalists and nutritionists. They're being murdered. And we have that memory. And it's really incredibly powerful when you let it go. Now, are there a lot of people who charge a lot of money and are very effective at healing? Yes. I think I'm pretty darn good and pretty darn effective. But on my journey, and I've been so lucky that my husband allowed me to have the experiences I had, I saw a lot of people around me suffering, and I continue to see them suffer to this day. And they don't have that kind of money to invest in healing. So I refuse to charge the kind of money that I could make 
for doing what I do. I could easily charge three, four, five hundred dollars an hour. I wouldn't have as many clients, but I certainly wouldn't be in this room talking to you right now in my bare feet. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to work with traumatized horses. I wouldn't be able to work with some of the beautiful, incredible people that I have met that I know are destined for greatness, that are incredible healers, and they don't even know it yet. But they can't afford $300 an hour, two or three or four or five times a week. Most people, when they hire me to talk to their animal, they had to give up something that month because they believed in me that much and loved their animal that much that it was worth it to give me a hundred dollars and go without new tires for their truck until next month. And that's the audience I choose to speak to. Because it's unfair to charge that much money. To say that you are not dedicated, ma'am, I'm sorry, but if you're not willing to pay me $500 an hour, you just must not really want to heal. <laughs> That's just not true. So many people would if they knew they could and they had this information. And so I'm standing on front of the mountaintop and if I was healthy enough, I'd stand on top of this podium and give all of you all this information for free. Because it's so simple. Stop looking for greatness outside yourself. It already exists in you. It exists in each and every one of us. Is there a heap of laundry piled on top of it? <laughs> yes. And it's hard, and it's a long road. It doesn't have to be hard. I don't think it's hard for a lot of people necessarily, and I'm not trying to make it hard for you by saying that. Please don't take it that way. But for the people, you know, the people that I work with, traumatized people, traumatized animals, it's a lengthy process. The journey, the hero's journey. I don't know if many of you are familiar with Joseph Campbell's work, the, the hero's journey. It's depicted by a, a sphere or a circle. And we start at the top, top of the journey, all metaphorical, of course, and a lot of archetypal information in there. But we begin our journey, and it's fraught with suffering. The wounded healer archetype, right? the trials and tribulations that we experience, divorce, death, illness, struggle, suffering, failure. And we get to the bottom of this circle, and we hit what some people refer to as the dark night of the soul. And for a lot of us, there's more than one. Because the circle starts again. So you get to this dark night of the soul. It's kind of like the bottom of the bottle for an alcoholic, metaphorically speaking. And you be begin to come up the other side. And you begin to resolve your issues one at a time. You overcome the doubt. You overcome the hatred. You overcome the fear. You overcome that anger. You overcome the belief that you're not good enough or you'll never succeed. And you get to the top and you sort of feel like, I have arrived. And you start your journey again. <laughs> but guess what? All of the trials and tribulations that you've overcome now become your medicine on the next journey. And that perfectly sums up my journey over and over and over and over again. So I've got some pretty powerful medicine because I've made some pretty powerful mistakes. And overcoming it is incredibly liberating and empowering. I promise you. I promise you. Any more questions? Um, Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the five doctors on the other side that you referred to earlier, that your communication with them and how... You're asking about the lady that's going to be speaking next month. 
She's a medical intuitive. I'm not a medical intuitive. Didn't you mention that you talked to five She was doctors. talking about the speaker that's going to be speaking. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. For some reason, it's stuck in my mind. No, that honest sentence. mistake. I, if I lived here, I'd come okay. to her talk to I'll ask you another one. I'll ask you a different I don't feel bad. <laughs> thinking I was a failure because oh. you want to talk to that lady, not me. But does, right? I'm so glad you asked that question. Because a year ago, I would have been heartbroken. I think I would have. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have another, just a general question, because I'm very interested in working with, with animals, and I've taken many classes. But mm -hmm. I would just love to hear how that um, experience, of, especially for me, I, I don't, hopefully I won't start to cry, but especially for traumatized animals and horses. Um, just how you've been able to help them neutralize their trauma. I mean, I think that they're here to heal us, and for us to mm -hmm. grow in our consciousness and awareness. Um, but I mean, sometimes I can get haunted by statistics and mail and, and stuff of, you know, roundups and things. But I was just wondering if you had anything to, like, when you get go down that rabbit hole of atrocities that are humans do to animals to help turn that around to a higher frequency to send love and light to the animal kingdom and maybe Mother Earth. Um, if you have anything to say about that. How's that for a question? <laughs> that question was so broad and has so many problems. I know. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm not gonna, Diane wanted me to repeat the questions. I'm not going to. Um, I'll, I will. Okay. It would take me two hours to adequately answer your question. She, her question is about animals. How do I dress and help to heal animals who are traumatized? She also mentioned that she's um, intuitive herself and is very empathic and is very affected by the negativity that is put out on Facebook and the news, etc. Mm -hmm. She also mentioned that she's interested in studying animal communication, as well as you mentioned a few, a few other things. Each and every one of the topics that you mentioned respectfully deserves a considerate, thoughtful answer. And I have so much to say on every single thing you mentioned. So what I would like to do is offer to talk to you for free for 90 minutes sometime in the future on the telephone. Because one of the things I see happening, if, if, may I please be honest and just give you some feedback. One of the things that I see happening with you here is that you are empathic. And that you are absorbing energy that doesn't belong to you. And there is no one session, no one answer for how to resolve that. You can have an intention, but your intention will be overridden by your memories of your past lives, as well as your belief systems, every religion and every healing modality you ever manifested through your energetic construct. So, it's a journey, and it is one worth taking if you have the sensitivity and the desire to work with animals. I hope that you have all heard me say this, and I'm glad to say it again. We have to heal ourselves before we can think that we can heal anyone else. And if we are still in a state where we are overcome, and believe me, I'm right there with you, sister. I Please do not hear me judging you. I'm just calling a thing a thing, okay? With love and compassion, I know what you're going through. I feel you. I get you, okay? There are things that we can do to help you clear out the vibration and frequencies that are allowing energies that don't belong to you in and that are helping you to see and perceive other people's trauma and emotions in such a way that it doesn't affect you. For me, it wasn't until recently that I would even have been able to answer this question without crying right alongside of you. In fact, I'm surprised that I did. So to me, I'm, I feel really good standing in my body right now and grounded that you aren't making me cry. To me, it means all the work I've been doing I'm making some progress, okay? I think you can, I know you can be there, okay? So how do we perceive ourselves 
as a healer, what does that mean to us? What, what commitments have we made in a past life to carry other people's burdens, to be a martyr? There's all kinds of conversations that we can have about that. Now with the animals. I have a lot of very strong opinions about animal communication and teaching animal communication because I made the mistake of trying to go out into the animal communication world and validate myself by paying other people tens of thousands of dollars who didn't like me and who said categorically what I do is not animal communication. You know why? Because they were threatened by me. Animal communication can be anything. Intuition, knowing, seeing, sensing, smelling, tasting, feeling, hearing. It can be all of it. But the traditional world of animal communication says no. Animal communication is only perceiving thoughts in the form of pictures, almost as if we're accessing the Akashic records, and then interpreting, by the way, through our energetic paradigm, our lens of distortion, our religious perception of how the universe works, mm -hmm. that can significantly influence the information you channel from an animal to a person. So I suggest that you find someone who A, comes highly recommended, who B, really wants people to succeed, who see, believes in other people's gifts and isn't trying to make you into them, they're trying to help you be the best you, you can be. Who D, will honor your gifts and abilities and help you find your blocks to your abilities and help you wide open manifest your potential. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Not a popular way to be in the field. Especially with death and dying, with trauma, there are a lot of preconceived notions and a lot of messages funneled through preconception. And um, I'm not a fan of that. I do not promote that. Um, how do I help animals overcome trauma, especially animals who have been significantly abused? Again, long, long answer. The best I can do in a short period of time is say, I don't work with other animal communicators. I honor the soul. I ask the soul to meet me. Meet me here. What is your truth? What do you have to say? How do you feel? What is your experience? What are your opinions? And then I apologize on behalf of humanity for what created the trauma. And I, I say it every day. Humans make horrible choices. But the only choice I have, and the only choice you have, if you want to live a meaningful life of purpose, is to get over it and put on your big girl panties. Buck up, buttercup. And forgive. Forgiveness is the only choice <coughs> if we want to overcome trauma. Does that make sense? So I go through a series of forgiveness exercises and I help them release and I help them to see and perceive it in a way that is in alignment with their soul. I call on the soul family of all fours and I help them to clear and release the memory of the emotional trauma and the physical pain from their body in the same way I did with humans when I worked with humans and I still do. I work about 60% with animals and 40% with humans. And then, in the last 15 minutes or so of the animal communication, I will then turn to the owner who is paying me for the session and say, you may now ask your question. I don't do it the way other animal communicators do. And the right people come to me. And I teach people animal communication. And the right people come to me. And you might be one of those and you might not, but I'm certainly willing to help you get to wherever you need to go. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, how do you work with people and like how do you make appointments and all of that? I have a website, which is either my name, JinnyJablonski.com or HeartOfTheHorse.us. And there's a calendar and a 
little PayPal button associated with it. And if you can't afford it, then just email me and tell me how much you can afford. I will not turn anybody away. Excuse me. Can you tell me what you meant when you were talking about an organic way of healing as opposed to something that there's something I didn't quite understand? Um, to me, organic versus inorganic uh, is an organic energy is a vibration or a frequency that exists naturally through consciousness, um, something that um, it is love or it is faith or it is fear or it is hate. You know, these, these are organic things. To me, the, when I use the word inorganic construct, to me, I perceive that as people trying to um, upgrade your energy field by installing an, an etheric antenna in your energy field, or by downloading coins to you, giving you activations. And, and this was one of the first ones I ever got, it's some sort of activation thing. But I, I remember that I used to do it, but I removed all that energy from my energy field, um, where you can be activated with something. It's kind of the idea of neuro-linguistic programming or theta healing or something where somebody wants to tell you, I'm programming in, that you are successful, okay? Mm -hmm. You are worthy of love. You are safe. You are good. You are worthy. So the reason I find that to be not the best way for everybody, certainly not for me, the analogy is, I touched Jesus' hand, and I came back with a thousand false beliefs, a thousand limiting beliefs that I was wrong, and everybody was bad, and everything was somebody else's fault, and nobody would ever love me, and I'm not good enough, and I'm not strong enough, and the whole nine yards, right? When you program in, if somebody would have come to me and programmed in, you are successful, Oh, here, Jenny, give me $5,000 and I'm going to help you manifest and you're going to be successful at anything you want to do. It would be in direct opposition to all of the thoughts that I had that already existed in me. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. You know, I'm never right. I'm not smart. I'm not pretty. Whatever they are. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And I'm just doing the simple, easy ones off the top that everybody can relate to. Doubt. How many different thoughts, feelings, and emotions have we all had related to self-doubt? Well, I'm not going to go to movies with my girlfriends tonight because that one, I'm sure she doesn't like me. And on and on and on and on. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't want to go too far down there because I don't want to go too far into specific modality. That's fine. I just wanted to understand what you were Mm -hmm. Inorganic to me means somebody from NASA coming to you and saying, I have the secrets to the universe. Give me $3,000 and I will download you with the codes to ascension. <laughs> so inorganic to me means you didn't do the work yourself. You didn't look inside. Right. You didn't do the hard work, the self-analysis, the forgiving. You didn't say the Ho'oponopono prayer 1.5 million times like I did. <laughs> Because believe me, there's something every day available to us to forgive somebody that comes from you. And there's days in my work that I think I could possibly say that prayer again, and I'm in a pasture with 40 horses, and then a horse will walk up and say, will you say that with me 50 times? <laughs> and my jaw hurts so bad, and I say, yes, I will. Because that is so powerful. So the Ho'oponopono prayer, if anybody doesn't know it, and it's per perfectly reasonable that you might not have ever heard of it, but if you haven't, it goes like this. It's a Hawaiian prayer. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Now you might ask, why am I leading off on me telling you that I'm sorry? Well, because if you hurt me in this life, there's a darn good chance in a past life I don't know why I hurt you. So we have to start somewhere. So why not start with us? And it clearly sets our intention to the universe and says, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Love can never hurt anybody. Spirit always tells me, 
Forgiveness is the key, love is the answer, and there's good in everything. In all my travels, I realized that, and there are other Hawaiian prayers that are sort of similar to what I'm about to share that, that I made up for myself that works for me and my clients. I think the Hawaiians already figured it out, though, because there, I know and I've been told there are other, a litany of Hawaiian prayers that are very similar. Um, and Joe Vitale, by the way, and I'm sure he's been here, spoken here before, Diane. Oh, he has a oh, part of it. Part of it. Maybe we should have him. Um, he's, he, he is a genius of the Ho'oponopono, but he just switched. He just switched now the focus of his work to now, how do we clear false beliefs? Because people are beginning to see the power in unburdening ourselves from those blocks and limitations. So, the second part of the prayer that I use and I say easily 150, 200 times a day in my work follows up with the Ho'oponopono. So again, the Ho'oponopono is, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. Here's my piece. And, and this is really hard to swallow, so you might get a tissue. I forgive everyone for everything unconditionally, no matter what, just to grab the camera, no matter what, including myself. I hear etherically people say telepathically, that's really hard when I get to that. Including myself, love is the answer. And I forgive everyone for everything unconditionally, no matter what, including myself, love is the answer. Notice, I love you in the Ho'oponopono, and we follow up with love is the answer. Spirit tells me all the time, forgiveness is the key, love is the answer, there's good in everything. How does this relate to clearing trauma from the body? Most trauma, this does not include experiencing war, etc. And all due respect to situational trauma, most trauma has a component of fear or unforgiveness or some, some level of shock. It exists as a frequency in our body. And if we can tap into that, we can clear it. Now, it might be connected to something else, and it might not want to go because it might be tied into, well, I don't believe I'm worthy of being healthy, so I'm not going to let this other thing go. No. So then it's a little more complicated. So we have to find out, okay, why is this certain thing not releasing? Oh, because it's tied to this other thing that happened to you when you were six years old or 13 years old, or when you disappointed your parents, or when you failed the test, or when you crashed the car, or more tragic experiences. Make sense? Any more? Yes, sir. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, did you uh, heal? 100% from the Lyme disease. I believe, I, well, I didn't tell my entire medical journey, so I had some arthritic and degenerative joint and disc disease and other things that were affecting me. Am I completely and totally healed? No, I'm not completely and totally healed. I don't think I would be on the earth if I were completely and totally healed. I think I am healed from the Lyme disease because it is no longer active. Do I have evidence of degenerative disc and joint disease? Yes. Have I been able to regenerate my bone tissue yet? Not yet. But I'm pretty sure that one day I will. I'm still tired a lot. I get fatigued very easily. I was bedridden for a long time, so my tendons and muscles are not as healthy and strong as they could be, so I, I do tend to re-injure my physical body. But, considering I was bedridden for near on nine years, the fact that in 2014 I was able to fly for 14 hours on an airplane sitting upright, 
to Australia says something. <laughs> I've gone to physical therapy. Um, again, they don't want to do your entire body, so I pretty much gave up on that. I try my best. I'm very busy with my work, so I don't really take a lot of time out for myself. If I didn't work, and all I did was work on healing myself, I would probably be a lot healthier. Um, it's difficult to travel. I, you know, I can't lift heavy things. I can't walk mm. far distances. Mm. But look at me. I'm standing in a room of 50 people, or, you know, and I'm, and I'm in Chicago. I'm not at home in bed. <laughs> you know, and I got my, my suitcase from the airport to the car rental place, and I rented a car, and I'm not stressed out. Mm. You know, the, all of that is, that's such incredible progress. You know, I used to, to be more on the, my nervous system was so fried that I cried for everything. Oh, I cried over anything. And it's because our nervous system is fried. So let me speak to that. We have about 15 more minutes, so please don't let me go on if someone has an important question, if you want to ask a question. But last February, I went to an equine chiropractic seminar hosted by Dr. Jay Comeric of, I believe, Boulder, Colorado. I think Boulder. Um, a girlfriend of mine co-hosts his workshops, and he teaches human chiropractors how to translate chiropractic to the equine body. And I was invited, allowed to come. I was not a chiropractor. I don't even have a degree. But because one of his dear friends and women that he mentors is a dear friend of mine, and she knows the efficacy of my work, and she wanted me to meet him. The remarkable thing for me happened when I opened his little spiral-bound uh, complimentary handbook that he gave with the class, and on the fourth page, it said general systems theory, and I got tingles in my body, and I turned the page, and it had a big picture of a nerve, and under it said soliton wave, S-O-L-I-T-O-N, soliton wave. And I started reading it. I had no idea why I was so excited. And it talked about scientists in Europe who discovered something called the soliton wave, which they identified as frequency that exists in the nervous system. And they measured it with an oscilloscope or some sort of specialty equipment that measures megahertz of frequency, and that they realized that each one of these frequencies, of course, created a unique sound, right, or a tone. And that, interestingly, there could be more than one of these frequencies existing on the same nerve, traveling in the same direction, or opposite directions, and they didn't affect one another. They didn't bombard one another, they didn't transform or transmute or distort one another. They stayed constant and never dissipated. And I jumped up and screamed, oh my God, this is what I see. Remember I told you earlier, I can see the 40 miles of nerves in your body and it's like this golden superhighway, but yours and mine ain't golden. There's a lot of, like on the traffic map in the morning and you're leaving the car to go to work and you look to see where it's red to avoid that route, right? Well, guess what the red places are? The places where those frequencies are. Guess what those frequencies are? Memories, emotions, feelings. Remember I said I was hearing people, hearing a lot of stuff and I didn't know what it was? One of the gifts I have is that I can hear energy. So if I tap in to your vagus nerve, I can hear the frequency of the doubt or the fear or the blame or the shame or the guilt or the frustration. And I, I didn't know until that day, this is what I'm seeing. Science validated my gift. Now, to tell them that's what it is, I don't know if they believe me, but for me, for me, science validated what I see, what I hear, and what I feel. And what I learned along the way is anything that does not vibrate at the frequency of love distorts me. It makes me feel funny. 
And they all, the, all the different negative feelings make me feel funny in a different way. Some give me a headache on my right side. Some give me a little bit of a stabbing in my ear on the left side. Some make my heart hurt. Some make my elbow tingle. Some make me cough. Some make, you know, some make my knee feel like I'm, like the, um, what's the muscle that starts with the M that's under the patella? Thank you. Some make the meniscus. Thank you, sir. So, that day to me was pivotal, and that was last February 2018. That was so incredibly validating for me. And on my journey, I realized, okay, some of the colors I'm seeing are the chakras. And, you know, I studied about all the chakras. And then, like a curtain one day, I didn't see the chakras anymore. A curtain just came and took the chakras away. And then I was focusing on what was left. And then I realized, oh, that's the Chinese meridian system. So then I had to go study with a lady that trans, transformed, translated the Chinese meridian system of the human body to the equine body. But she said to me, you don't need to study with me. You already see it. You don't need to know where the points are on the body. You can see it. So I was being turned away by masters, you know, who said, well, you already know this. You don't need to chart. You don't need to memorize anything. It's intuitive for you. You can see it. You can feel it. So when I pretty much got a handle on what's the bladder meridian, what's the conception vessel, what's the triple heater meridian, and what does it mean, and how is it blocked, and, and how, do, how does a, a blockage here manifest, all of a sudden one day, like a curtain, the meridian system went away. And what was left? The nerves. And that happened in late 2017, I guess, so that in 2018, I could go to this equine chiropractic seminar and take possession of this book and find this information. So now I work almost solely with the nerves in the human body. To be honest, I don't think about the chakras anymore because the chakras are like a thermometer telling you you have a, I'm sorry, telling you you have a, a fever. It's a symptom. It's not the cause. So spirit taught me about the chakras so that I could at least have the conversation with the man in the red shirt, right? And then he taught me about the Chinese meridian system so that I can talk to people in terms if they relate to that. And a lot of times I teach people to do energy work with horses in relation to the meridians because it works, because it is effective. But to heal trauma then, spirit needed to show me the next layer and reveal the nervous system. And that's where it's at. Yes, ma'am. So do you use, are you able to identify for people within their nervous system uh, the earliest experiences, since that's what holds memories and emotions? Are you able to identify that for that person so that they're able to start working with that so they can let it go? Yes. Her question is, am I able to identify the earliest experiences of trauma in a person's life so that they are able to let it go? The answer is yes, but it's a little more complicated than yes. It's yes, but. Mm -hmm. It's not yes, but. It's yes, and. Mm -hmm. Yes, and. Today, you might not be ready for me to tell you the first time you ever experienced fear was when you were in the womb and your mom and dad were going to get divorced and you didn't understand what was happening. Sometimes we have to go, we have to dust the furniture, and then we have to move the furniture around. And do you understand I'm not, not trying to be condescending by using that metaphor? Um, we have to start somewhere. There might be some you know, huge thing going on right now that's sort of right in front. Also, I wouldn't do that unless your soul told me you were ready for it. So do I give someone one session and promise them, I'm just going to take you to the beginning of all trauma? No, no. It's a process. And it's not even all trauma. It's the first time you experience self-doubt. It's the first time you experience fear. It's the first time you experience unforgiveness from someone else. It's the first time you experienced your parents being disappointed in you. So it's complex. That's why they call it complex trauma, complex PTSD. 
The answer is yes, but it's not easy. And if you would like to do the work, find someone who is willing to work with you long term. And and I don't mean to harp too much on the money thing, but it's almost impossible for anyone to really come up with enough money to do, do you know what I mean? So what I try to do is give people as many tools for you to do as much work as you can on your own and then call me when you get stuck. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I help people learn how to manage their own energy system every day so we're not adding on and we can be reasonably balanced and we can take something little bites at a time. Now, there is a book that's really fabulous that I would like to recommend that, to recommend that I use. We have five more minutes. And I, I believe it's called Heal Your Aura, Heal Your Life by Barbara Y. Martin. I think it is Heal Your Aura, Heal Your Life. It's one of the first books I ever came across. It's a white book with a giant orange stripe and a blue stripe. And it talks about the auric field. It talks about the colors and the subtle bodies. And it gives legitimate exercises and intentions for everything I'm talking about. It was one of the first practices I used for myself. In fact, all of the little prayers, there's a lot of them, and it's really complicated, and you, you know, you kind of have to almost be a little cerebral to really sort of enjoy the book and get into it and use it. But um, I used to write down all the little prayers on index cards. Well, by the time I got half the way through the book, I had like 50-something index cards all in the book, and it made the book the giant book. And from time to time, I would be carrying the book wherever I was going, and the book would go flying on the floor, and all my index cards would go flying. But it would be a conversation starter for a lot of people. You know. um, the, I'll give you an example. I haven't used it in maybe four years or so, but I'll give you an example. It will say something like, you know, I call on the, so you, you balance yourself and you focus on your chakras and you're calling on your divine light, your, your soul light, and it will tell you, choose a specific ray, um, not you choose, but it will identify a specific ray, like the, you know, purple or pink or green or whatever. So I call on the green ray and I intend to um, go to the first time I experience jealousy in my life and I intend to release it. And it's a beautiful and more lengthy and more complex than that. But there are exercises for maybe 30 or 40 primary um, negative experiences, emotions, or feelings. So that's an incredible tool, and someone documented all of it. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, I, I saw on the internet um, a thing about the Rwandans. And, and after the genocide in, in Huntsville, and Western therapists came in to help them. And they and, kicked them out. Hmm? And they kicked them out. They asked them to leave. Yeah. And they, they <laughs> said, for them, this analysis thing just didn't work. For them, what worked was to get out in the sunshine and dance and drum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So she's saying that she recently became aware of an article written um, by, a, I think it was a therapist, um, who responded to Rwanda to help them overcome the trauma of war. And there were some uh, therapists and psychiatrists that went there, and eventually they were asked to leave. And they were asked to leave because in the words of the Rwandans, they put us in a, in a room by ourselves, without our community, and they forced us to talk about our trauma, which drove our trauma deeper and deeper, reliving the trauma which I will share with the veterans that I work with. That's what the cognitive behavior therapy has done to many of the clients I have had, is just force them to give a voice over and over and over, but not a tool to release it or, or let it go. And so the Rwandans, this woman was saying, said that they would rather go back to their tradition of being in community and supporting one another and validating one another and going outside and being in the sunshine and dancing and singing. What is dancing? What is singing? It's vibration, it's frequency, it's releasing. That's their daily practice of managing their energy field. 
And this is what has happened to the indigenous people all across the, of the world that have been limited, that have been told, stop doing your practices. Stop walking with nature. Stop being in alignment with your body, mind, and spirit. No wonder we know what the results are of that. Right? Thank you for bringing that up. That's a beautiful note to, to end our presentation on. Dance, sing, be happy. The four Buddhist divine abodes, what are they? Anybody know? Loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Equanimity is basically the United States equivalent of into every life a little rain must fall. How do we deal with it? Do we react in extremes? Our nervous system is fried. We start crying. We become overwrought with grief or sadness or shame or guilt. Or are we more balanced in our reaction? <coughs> the saying, it's not what happens to you, it's how you react to it that matters, has a lot of validity. Thank you guys so much. You're so